You're sure you want to do this with me? Yeah. You know what you're getting into? More or less. You know how long it might take? Of course. That it might not even be possible in the first place? We'll have to see about that. Shelter, storage, farms, arenas, housing, pylons, crafting. You want to go through the entire game with a handicap on all of these things. Yeah, I don't see why not. You're a goddamn lunatic. Welcome aboard. Hello, everybody. My name is Captain Freefall, and I'm here with Zealous. Today, we're going to try and beat Terraria without ever placing a single block. Is it possible? Well, let's find out. I thought you said I was going to die in the intro. If you want. What? Anyways, before we can jump into the game, we need to define the challenge. Luckily, this one's pretty simple. Anything that says can be placed cannot, in fact, be placed. Blocks, platforms, furniture, these are all banned. And just to be sure, we'll also be avoiding things like rope coils, dirt bombs, the snake charmer's flute, and really anything that would fall under the common sense definition of building. With that said, modifying pre-existing terrain in any capacity is not building and is therefore legal. That should be obvious, mountain removal has nothing to do with construction, but the power of the hammer shouldn't be understated. As for our world, we're going to be playing on classic difficulty, since it's the easiest difficulty that isn't literally cheating. We'll allow ourselves alternate worlds, but any alternates we use must be freshly generated for the challenge, and not be old playthroughs. We went with Crimson on our main world, which will give us Icor when we get to hard mode. And that's pretty much all for the setup. Zealous, you ready? Yep, let's go. Alright, let's do this. Spawning in a brand new world, it's time to explore. Which, actually, is quite difficult. You never realize how much you rely on rope until you're deprived of it. Worse yet, we're trying to conserve the natural landscape as much as possible, since any action taken with a pickaxe is permanent. As night falls though, we are called back to spawn for an even greater task. Notorious for opening closed doors, Logan the Guide must be kept alive until we fight the Wall of Flesh. In a normal playthrough, the guide could respawn, provided adequate housing, but oh wait, we can't do that! Our best bet is to put him in a hole, though we can't cover it up. It's the best we can manage on such short notice. Despite our valiant effort, though, Logan was not long for this world. Rest in peace, Logan, and may your soul be free of such terrible fate. All right, let's go mining. We'll have to generate a new world later, but there's no reason we can't plunder this one for all it's worth. Our only limiting factor is inventory space, which is incredibly limited since, you know, we can't build chests. Usually, the first mining expedition has the sole goal of getting loot, but golden chests is only a part of what makes underground cabins so good. Occasionally, they'll spawn with a crafting station, like a workbench or an anvil, allowing us to craft with them. Since we can't place down crafting stations, this is the only way we'll be able to access their recipes. Sadly, there are crafting stations that aren't available in these cabins, like the furnace, which is required for smelting. We're willing to give up many things, but being unable to refine ore would severely limit our ability to craft armor which we'll need before taking on any bosses. Is this it then? Are we forced to place down a furnace? I guess we could use ingots found exclusively in chests, but that would still leave us far behind in progression. Using the fires of hell, raw ore is refined into perfect ingots. Among the obsidian furniture of the ruined houses is the Hellforge, burning far hotter than any furnace could achieve. The journey to the underworld is perilous at best, and the destination offers much more danger still. Yet, to perform any smelting operation, it must be done, and it is the lesser of two dangers when compared to not using protection. <laughs> what? Why are you looking at me like that? Anyways, after we got evicted from hell, I take to the skies, finding two star furies in the process. Meanwhile, Zealous heads to the caverns and finds an anvil for us to craft armor at. Between this new gear and the ragtag team of accessories we're sporting, it's probably time to take a look at bosses. Our ultimate goal is to fight the Moon Lord, after which the credits roll. But that's a long ways away. At this stage in the game, there are several bosses we could summon, so let's weigh our options. The first option is the Eye of Cthulhu, the natural player's choice. 
but despite being a staple of Terraria's identity, this eyeball is pretty irrelevant. We'll definitely end up fighting it, but it doesn't do anything for us progression-wise. Crimtain bars aren't particularly useful without tissue samples, which this boss doesn't drop. And since we're playing in classic mode, we can't get the Shield of Cthulhu. What? That's a scam. That's your opinion. We'll get back to that later. Instead, I decided to take a crack at Skeletron. Not a serious attempt, otherwise I would have waited for Zealous, but just to see what he'd be like, you know, difficulty-wise. The answer, apparently, was despawning, which he ended up doing while I was trying to replicate that one oh, Ymir video. I, he despawned. Sadness. Whoops. There's still plenty of night left. It'd be a shame to waste it, not fighting something. If only I had a suspicious-looking eyeball in my back pocket. He could cheese this fucker. Oh, he's weak! Oh my weak. god, look at that fucking health bar! Bro, 2800 HP. <laughs> oh my god! Oh it's no, perfect. oh no, 12 damage! Uh, yeah, we killed him in like 35 seconds. It's not even funny how easy it was. The Queen Bee ended up being much the same story. This is a challenge video, right? What's the point if there's no challenge to speak of? For the remainder of this video, we're going to be playing on expert mode. With twice as much health, twice as much damage, and a whole flurry of new attack patterns, we're going to have to try a little harder than that just to get by. But that's not the only change we're making. We're also revising the rules, and completely banning alternate worlds now. Barring catastrophic failure, this world, no build 2, is the last world we'll use for the challenge. So, since we're going to be staying here for a while, I suppose I ought to give you a little tour. World's up. Just east of spawn is a cabin with an anvil, a bookshelf, and an additional chest nearby. This will function as our main base of operations, due to the proximity to spawn as well as the incredibly high utility it provides us. Startlingly close as well is the crimson, which I'll touch on when it becomes a problem. Beyond that lies the tundra and the dungeon, putting our jungle to the left side of the map, along with the aether. And since we've generated a new world, we get a new guide too. Or rather, we get an old guide reborn. Welcome back, Logan. This time, we'll be sure to protect you from any zombies that might kill you prematurely. How are you going to pull that off? That's a lot of nights until we fight the Wall of Flesh. Shh. Do you hear that? Yeah? That's Yokai Girl's subconscious swing, which means it's time for something both highly technical and important to our progression. So, let's begin. Slope blocks, which can be created using a hammer, instantly eject any entity that's clipped inside of them. The direction of this ejection is determined by which half of the block is open, giving it two possible options. If there is no tile immediately in the vertical direction, then the entity will move vertically. However, if there is a tile blocking it, the entity will travel horizontally, ignoring tile collision completely. This means that clipping into a slope block can clip the player inside of more blocks, and chaining slopes together creates what's known as a hoik, which can move an entity at ludicrous speeds through solid ground. Of course, we're not interested in speed, just clipping through tiles. By hammering a slope block the guide is standing on, the slope will change shape and now clip into the guide's hitbox. Then, the slope will forcefully clip the guide into another slope, and a few more clips him well into the ground. Now, zombies and the like cannot possibly reach him, since entering the hoik requires the entity to be clipping in the first place. Only the few entities that can go through solid walls pose any threat to him, and their enemy pathing is easy enough to manipulate. This is how we keep the guide alive, and we'll end up using this technique on every NPC we want to save. Pretty nifty, huh? Crazy to think that this was discovered by Joe Terraria building a weird fountain nine years ago. Wait, really? Yep, that's science for you. With Logan nice and secure, we can turn our attention back to progression. Alongside actual difficulty, expert mode offers plenty in terms of powerful gear. For example, we can actually get the Shield of Cthulhu now. Yes! Which I will not be using. Dude. What? I just don't think that- Oh, you do not want to say that on the internet. Oh, really? Yeah, don't say it. Mm-hmm. You're gonna regret it. Yeah, right. <laughs> Shield of Cthulhu? Bad. 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 What the? Told ya. I don't even have Twitter! While our opinions on the Shield of Cthulhu may differ, there's another accessory we can agree is great. The Brain of Confusion. That 16% dodge chance has saved my life on many occasions, and if that's not enough to warrant an accessory slot for the entire run, nothing will be. Make a note of that, actually, we'll get back to accessories later. For now, I think I'll check on some current events is invading the spawn region. Despite initial reports indicating no settlement in the area, the goblins are keen to swarm there anyways. It is estimated that over 100 goblins Oh, that's bad. There, very, very bad. Those sorcerers could totally kill him. We mine the meteorite first. Definitely the meteorite. After fighting the goblins and mining the meteorite, it's time to resume our crusade. 
Unsurprisingly, Skeltron absolutely murked us without any arena, so we leveled off the top of the dungeon and flattened the nearby hill. We can't really do more, since there are massive pits on either side which we're not allowed to build over. Obviously, this arena was inadequate, so we also flattened with the bottom of one of these pits, giving us a very large runway, if nothing else. Even so, we were still underprepared for Skeltron, so we went back to the caves, where we found the Goblin Tinkerer, all tied up. I'll mention now that we were playing during October, meaning that the Halloween content is on, such as rotten eggs to throw at NPCs. Safely hoiked into the wall, we free Xanos so that we can start reforging gear. Yes, it's a scam, but it's not like there's much else we can spend our coin on. This, combined with actually crafting the meteorite armor, is what gives us the edge while fighting Skeletron. Finally, we're granted access to the dungeon, allowing us to use an alchemy table. Can you believe that up to this point, all of our potions have been looted from chests? It's not like we could have crafted them, since workbenches do not naturally spawn with bottles on top. With that said, being able to craft potions isn't exactly a game changer. Our ability to fish is incredibly limited, since our only actual source of bait are cans of worms, effectively making us unable to craft these potions. And besides, we've been using 100% loot up till now, and there's definitely more where that came from. All in all, dungeon access was kind of a letdown. If you're stupid, that is. Elaborate. Murasama. 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 Muramasa. What, you're gonna make the Knight's Edge? Yes. Alright, you have fun with that. I'm gonna go make a hell of eater. You see, what he doesn't know is that the Knight's Edge got a huge buff in 1.4.4. Before, you'd craft it because you wanted the Terra Blade, but now it's actually really good. And yeah, a hell of eater is kind of important, but you know what's more important? Being able to kill things. Our weapon choice is pretty limited, and it'll only continue to get worse as time goes on. So the fact that he's passing this up tells you that he's barely skimmed the labor of love patch notes. Which I find is likely as hell. Hey, do you want to fight Deerclops? Yeah, sure, but first... Oh, that actually looks kind of... Oh my god, this thing's cool! Anyways, Deerclops was new for us. The last time we played Vanilla Terraria was before the Don't Starve crossover, and he was actually quite the fun boss. The magic hands were kind of annoying, but the eye bone alone made it worth the fight. I briefly mentioned inventory management before, but I'll elaborate now. Our home base gives us two chests to work with, which is absolutely atrocious after having used magic storage. Deciding which items to keep and which to throw away is a huge part of the day-to-day -day in this run, so personal storage like the void bag is a must-have. The eye bone is a pet that doubles as a piggy bank, though I didn't realize it at first. It's a great replacement for the money trough, especially since it automatically follows you around. And if you were wondering where all the blood moons were, don't worry, so were we. Yeah, I don't know what's up with that. All right, this is the moment of truth. We have one attempt at the Wall of Flesh, and if we mess up, it's game over for this world. We haven't come this far to fail now, not after spending over 20 hours of our lives dedicated to our cause. No, we will prevail, because we must, no matter the cost. Bye, Logan. But let's talk about that cost real quick. What? Did you think we'd go into the Wall of Flesh blindly? Not a chance in hell, my friend. The fight was far too important for that. In fact, we spent literal days making preparations. The Wall of Flesh has a few unique mechanics to it, the main one being turning hell into an auto-scroller. Contact with the wall is deadly, so movement speed becomes a top priority. Thus, the natural counter to the Wall of Flesh is the Bridge of Hell, which turns the treacherous terrain of the underworld into a straight line. It is, and I cannot stress this enough, the meta. Obviously, building a bridge is out of the question. I briefly entertained the idea of carving one out from the ceiling, but that's no good either. That puts us in a bit of a pickle, since the flattest thing in the underworld are the pools of lava. If only there was a potion that allowed you to walk on lava. All right! As it turns out, water walking potions are within our crafting building, which means that lava pools become mini sections of Hellbridge. Ironically, that means that solid landmass is the obstacle, poking out of an otherwise peaceful pool of molten rock. Now, the higher the lava level, the less protrusions there are, the longer the bridge. The caves above have plenty of lava with it, so we got to work flooding the underworld. Digging channels took several hours, even with the thousands of bombs bought from the local skeleton merchant. Now that we've got an arena, we still need to figure out how we're actually going to kill this thing. Turning back to the meta, another tried and true strategy is using the B-Nade. It's like a shrapnel homed in on targets, terrifying to think about. B-Nades are dropped from the Queen Bee, a boss we killed less than two hours into the run. Would you believe me, then, if I told you we did not absolutely shred the Queen Bee while farming her, and actually TPK'd a few times? That's the challenge of expert mode right there, and we're well rewarded for our pains. 400 bee nades each is more than enough to kill the Wall of Flesh. But wait, won't the bees get instantly incinerated by the lava? F 
This is true. Bees and lava mix like food in Yuyuko, which is to say that the bees don't stand a chance. We're going to need a solid protective layer in there. What do you think about dumping a bunch of water down there to make obsidian? Could work. Where are we getting the water from? Do you remember the world with the slime house? Oh, I like that idea. So what did we do? That's right, we bombed a screen-wide duct to drain the ocean all the way to the bottom of the world. For some reason, no obsidian generated beneath this massive chasm. Instead, it all generated to the right of the duct, solidifying the bridge for a very long way. Some small sections even still had water in them, which I'm pretty sure should be impossible. Quite frankly, we have no idea why no obsidian was found beneath the original flood. Theories range from the half-height nature of this particular lava pool all the way to missing checks in the game logic. But really, it doesn't matter. None of it mattered. The bridge, the bees, it didn't make a damn dent! The hours we had spent painstakingly demolishing every ruined house, flattening every protruding ash stalagmite, avoiding voodoo demons like the plague. It was all for naught. We had spent days and it didn't even matter. The fact is, the wall of flesh is just too damn easy. Turns out that two the bee's knees buffed by hive packs is enough to absolutely shred the wall of flesh. The fight lasted a little over a minute and it barely reached the obsidian bridge. Better to be safe than sorry, sure, but man I want at least eight of those hours back. I'll be honest, I was not looking forward to this part of the run. Early hard mode is the largest difficulty spike in the game, and it's definitely responsible for a few of the loose screws in my brain. Personal reasons aside though, our challenge suddenly becomes a lot more difficult. From here on out, the hard mode anvil is the main crafting station used by the vast majority of recipes. Made from either mithril or orichalcum, this crafting station cannot be found in the wild, and therefore cannot be used by us. We are now screwed when it comes to crafting. Armors and weapons are capped at palladium, and you can just forget about crafting any wings. Speaking of accessories, let's talk about that note from earlier. Most accessories have some sort of crafting tree, allowing players to combine effects to create some incredibly powerful equipment. But all of these recipes require usage of the Tinkerer's Workshop, which we can buy, but not place down. This means that we have to make tough decisions about what equipment we're using, especially now that class-specific bonuses actually matter. The only thing that isn't severely underperforming right now is the Knight's Edge, which is still an amazing weapon. But even that will come to an end, as going melee becomes increasingly difficult. Right now, we need to examine what we can get and plan from there. Idea, Daedalus Stormbow. Sure. We're not ready to fight that! Can she even spawn? No! Wait, then why is the music playing? I don't know. This is weird. Yeah. Anyways, the Daedalus Stormbow is dropped by Hallowed Mimics, which can be found underground or summoned by the Key of Light. The latter method requires collecting 15 souls of light though, so we're sent to the underground either way. Of course, the bow isn't the only thing that we can get from the underground hollow. Hallowed Mimics also drop the Illuminant Note, the last hook we'll be able to get. And if you're feeling real lucky... Uh, what the fuck? What? <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> I feel like clip it! Oh, fucking clip that shit! Fuck you! What incredible stroke of luck later, and Zealous has a rod of discord. And after only killing a few dozen chaos elementals too. It's like a 1 in 400 drop chance in expert mode, which I would try to compare to the chance that I dropped a not fade back in 2021, except for the fact that no one agrees on what that percentage is. But the point is the same. Zealous is one lucky bastard. I was going to give him the first pair of wings, but with that luck? Nah, those wings are mine, and we will be able to get wings, since we can- Freefall, I hate to interrupt, but I've found a second one. WHAT?! I don't know! Mm. What?! No, How get, come to the surface right fucking now, let me see this shit in my hands. Alright, now t go ahead and teleport. WHAT THE FUCK?! Yeah, I'm not bullshitting you. Okay, oh let's go to the God. bestiary. How many how many we can total? <laughs> now, I'm not mad, not mad at all, at how I've spent hours and hours and hours and hours farming underground, how I can't recall the last time I saw if one of those <laughs> items drop, how Zealous outdoes my entire life in a single day, how I Oh, he crashed. Hold on. Okay. While he's rebooting, let's talk about the Crimson for a second. Freefall said that he'll touch on it again when it becomes a problem. But here's the thing. It won't. I mean, the Herplings are super annoying, 
but the real threat is the fact that the Crimson makes NPC housing invalid. But since we can't build houses at all, it actually doesn't matter. Oh hey! How you doing? Good, uh, you were saying about the wolf necklace? Oh yes, of course. Added in 1.4.4, Lilith's Necklace is a mount summon that transforms the user into a wolf with absolutely insane mobility. But before I could get my hands on one, the game decided to do a little bit of trolling. While we had planned to kill the Destroyer first, it seems that the twins are actually the easier boss. Yes, there are two of them, but guess what? There's two of us! And now that I've got a wolf mount, we're ready to take them on. Just, you know, whenever they decide to spawn. Any day now. <sighs> well, I'm gonna go make lunch. That was, that was, that was! All right, one mech down, two to go. Next on our list is the Destroyer, who is actually quite difficult to fight without an arena. Sprawling across the ground, he gives nowhere for us to stand. But I've got an idea to counter that. But wait, that's the wrong boss. Look, man, I don't want to have to fight this thing either. She's a royal pain in the rear. But the fact is that the Wing Slime Mount is our best bet against the Destroyer, the Volatile Gelatin will be a great asset, and the Crystal Assassin Armor is better than Palladium. Anyways, with these new accessories, we're ready to take on the Destroyer. And what a fight that was. Oh, I got head. Dead. No. <laughs> oh, he's Damn. coming, he's coming, he's, he's coming, coming. He's coming, he's on his way? Really? He's coming. Oh. Oh, yeah. Nope. Well. He's up. Holy shit. No yeah. cap. Five. Oh, you're alive? Yep. Let's oh. fuck up his ass! <laughs> fuck him up, boy! <laughs> oh, the triple player destroyer, you fool! Oh, you you fool! <laughs> you fool! Yeah! yeah. <laughs> fuck you! Oh boy. my god! Oh my The last of the mechanical bosses is Skeletron Prime, but honestly, he's barely worth mentioning. The fight was really easy, especially now that Zealous is rocking some hollowed armor. Wait, what the fuck? Yeah, remember when I said we can only craft up to palladium armor? I lied. You see, hollowed armor comes in two variants since the texture update in 1.4. The regular set is crafted at a hard mode anvil and uses the updated texture. However, the ancient set is crafted at an altar, and the only notable difference is that the old textures are being used instead of the new. That's okay, considering we kinda look like complete idiots anyways. It's not that we don't want to accessorize, but we kind of can't. I mean, there are loads of cosmetics we just can't craft, and don't get me started on dyes. There is exactly one dye we will be able to use, and it does not improve our look. It's a minor complaint, yeah, but I needed to get it off my chest, since last time at least I found a nice scarf. Anyways, back to the armor. The Hollowed Set also has four different hats to choose from, each granting a bonus to a given class. We should think hard on this decision, since this is the last armor set we'll be crafting, and due to a finite supply of Hollowed Bars, there are no takebacks. We need to think about not just what weapons we're using now, but also what we'll use to defeat- I went Ranger. Bro, say- The Ranger thing makes sense, trust. But since Zella sold one of our two emblems, instead of using Shimmer to get what he wanted, I've got an extra equipment slot that I should fill. That means it's time to go on a little heist, don't you think? The Jungle Temple is an incredibly difficult place, especially since we're still using the Knight's Edge. Worse yet, it is filled to the brim with traps. But inside a temple chest, we find what we're looking for. The Solar Tablet summons a Solar Eclipse an event that I will use to get myself a Moonstone. But that's not the only piece of equipment I'm upgrading. I also get a Marrow, but not from the 0.5% drop chance from Skeleton Archers. Pro tip for grinding, every item has a 100% drop chance from your friends if their cloud is on the line. That and the Deadless Stormbow will not be super useful against Plantera. Yeah, have you finished the arena yet? I have. All right, and let's go. The idea behind the arena is optimized wolf movement. 
We still don't have wings, but Going Wolf gives us so much mobility we won't need them for this fight. Seriously, Belgarath was right. This form rocks. Anyways, I was in charge of carving out the arena, mainly because Freefall really didn't want to do it. So I mined out a bunch of platforms, all within reasonable jumping distance. There's a giant pit at the bottom for all Plantar spiky balls to fall into, and there is no lighting because we can't place any torches down, god damn it! With the arena finally done, and us finally remembering to grab life fruit, it's time to fight Plantar. Gollum was, as always, easy, and that means that we're almost done. All that's left is to go to the dungeon and start the lunar events. But are we ready? I mean, that event is tough, and I'm still using a freaking lucky horseshoe. Our best equipment is from early hard mode. I don't think we stand a freaking chance against Moonlord. But we haven't come this far to give up now, and there's still one last place we can look to get some endgame equipment. It was always going to come back to this. Without wings? Are you insane? Yes, we need the equipment, plain and simple. And if we can pull this off, if we can defeat her, we'll have some very fine equipment indeed. <sighs> you are a goddamn lunatic, you know that? Fine then, what are we gonna get from the Toho boss? There are three things we need to get. The Eventide, the Empress Wings, the Soaring Insignia. These are our objectives, and we will fight until we have them. Are you ready? I'm as ready as I'll ever be. Then let's go. Oh shit! Ow. Oh god. But... I'm dead. Oh. Okay. Come on, just. Oh, really? Oh, fuck off. Oh. oh, fuck. Second phase soon. Second phase now. 300? <laughs> yeah, it's actually bullshit that the fucking trails do damage on that. Uh, we got her! Uh, I got Holy her. fuck! But the fact. What'd you get? Yes! Eventide? No, I got the fucking wings. Oh, you got the fucking wings. Uh, Yeesh. Okay, uh, that actually makes the next attempt so much easier because if we're both in the air, then that means uh, we can go fucking anywhere. Like, no more staying confined to the ground. Oh my god, that's so nice. Okay, found out, found out. Oh yeah. Ow, oh, I died. I tried not to, okay? Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. Wings! I'm fucking Christ. Christ. You. <laughs> Okay. All right, that is the Empress gear. Yep, the plan all along was to use the Eventide, a bow that shoots five projectiles and perfectly synergizes with the ranged armor set, not to mention the magic quiver and Zealous's ranger armor. The wings and the insignia replaced the horseshoe and the double jump bottle, giving us infinite flight time on some very powerful wings. The brain of confusion and the hollowed armor set bonus will allow us to dodge many, many attacks, all of which will trigger the cross necklace's doubled invincibility frames, making us almost untouchable. All of our accessories will be reforged to menacing, which the Goblin Tinkerer has been very kind to us about. Seriously, we only ran out of money near the end, which was quickly regained due to grinding the Empress. That's the equipment we're going to fight the Moon Lord with. We're as ready as we'll ever be to fight the final boss of Terraria without having ever built a block. I guess we are, huh? Really just did an entire Terraria run in a single video. Yeah. It's been a real journey to get here. A long and difficult journey that's taken over 50 hours of our lives. But now, it's finally time to end it. Oh, let's just kill these fucking things. Oh, oh my god. Dude, this guy's tiny. Is this guy even a real boss? He doesn't even drop a fucking treasure bag. It, it, it's so wrong that we just it have to feels... fucking throw him away. 
what you could do is, like, they always send beams of light. Okay. On the ground. I... Point. Oh, oh, yeah. I may die. Fuck! Yeah, holy shit. I'm not supposed to be the one to die after the boss fight. It's gotta be you. Okay! Okay. You really gotta be careful. My, my health is already super low. Ow! No! Oh! Ooh, dodge! Where'd he ah! go? Oh my god! Found him. <laughs> I... One hand's about to go. Uh, be careful, be careful, they spawn true eyes, and my minion is very obviously off. Okay. Can we get top? That's good, because then I can worry about fighting on one axis. My, my hitting is not gonna uh, can't no. really Alright, aim for the core. Leave me alone. Leave me alone! Yeah, we were never gonna do this without this. No. God. Not even close. Yeah, <laughs> baby. Okay. You can't beat the game with <laughs> without <of> building. Yeah. <laughs> oh. oh my god. There you have it, folks. You can, in fact, beat Terraria without building. All it takes is having Zealous there to get every single rare drop. In all seriousness, this challenge just wouldn't have happened without him. So, a huge thanks to him, and you can find his channel in the description down below. God, I just said description down below. What am I, a YouTuber? Yeah, 6,000 subscriber looking ass. 6,000? Good grief, that's a lot of people. Guess I should start the work on the next video then, huh? If you want to upload in the next six months, yeah. All right then, see ya! That's not a normal slime. Spencer. <laughs> Spencer! <laughs> Spencer! <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> what? <laughs> Spencer just dropped out of fucking heaven? Huh? Reincarnation is real. It's real.